one of the things I've always wanted to do as a writer is go against stereotypes. And I think there's always assumptions made about the way certain people look, like you were saying, or the way um, they dress, or the way they talk, or, um, or what maybe a nation has been saying about them. And I think it's really important that as writers, as young people, as young thinkers, that we're constantly questioning the narrative, right? So the narrative has too often been that um, one group of people is one way and another group of people is another way. And so it's important to, in thinking about writing, constantly ask yourself, where does that information come from? And how, do, how, how are we seeing it? How are we taking it in? So when I was writing Harbor Me, um, which is a story about six kids in a, a, a sixth grade classroom um, for kids who learn differently, I kept asking myself, where is the hope in it? And, and trying to write and rewrite and rewrite and rewrite to get to that hope. So um, this section I'm going to read is about Esteban. And Esteban's dad has been um, taken away. He's, been, he's in the process of getting deported. And they live in Crown Heights. They live in Brooklyn, New York. Um, Esteban is from the Dominican Republic. And in this chapter, he's gotten a poem from his dad. His dad has started write, writing poems. And Esteban has realized that what he can do is translate his dad's poems into English and share them with the world. The next week, just as we were getting ready to do math problems, Esteban walked back into our classroom. Miss Laverne, oh, I'm sorry, Esteban had been missing for a while. Miss Laverne didn't even try to keep us from jumping out of our seats to hug him and slap his back and say, where were you? And we were so scared you had left forever. And is your dad home? He's still gone in Florida, Esteban said, when we finally calmed down. But he sent me another poem. Amari had his arm around Esteban's shoulder, and Tiago was standing as close to him as could be. The rest of us had gone back to our seats, but we were all staring at E and in wonder. It felt magical to have him back. It felt like we were almost perfect again. Miss Laverne asked him to come up to the front of the class to read the poem to us. And when Amari finally let him go, he, he carefully removed a piece of yellow paper from between his notebook pages. His uniform was clean but wrinkled, and the dark circles under his eyes looked like they covered most of his face now. He looked skinnier, too. We moved to live with my aunt in Queens, he said, and one of my crazy baby cousins tried to eat this poem. He held up the paper. The edge of it had a tiny bite taken out of it. Esteban shook his head, but he was smiling. I'm going to read it in Spanish first, he said. He read, and even though I didn't understand the words, they were so beautiful, they sounded like music. And I put my head down on my desk to listen better. Now I'm going to read the English translation that I made for you, he said. He looked at the five of us, then at Miss Laverne. He seemed older somehow, like he had gone away and lived a whole life and then come back, came back to us. And in the night, he read, when the dog barks at shadows, tell him not to be afraid of what he cannot see, are the things he does not yet understand. There is mystery everywhere. Beneath rocks, there is damp earth and an army of ants planning a revolution. Esteban stood at the front of the room, staring at the page. Then he lifted his head and looked at us. We cheered again, even louder this time. I don't know if any of us really understood his dad's poem, but for a long time after he finished reading, I thought about that army of ants, how they were coming together, like us. So for me, in writing that book, thank you, I found the hope not only in Esteban's dad's poetry, but um, in the way these kids who didn't really know each other in the beginning of the books got closer and closer and closer. I was thinking about um, how powerful writing is, even in terms of social media, right? My, um, I remember when it was the big walkout, and all the young people were you know, texting each other and, putting, and Snapchatting about it and Instagramming about it. 
And then thousands of kids walked out of their school, right? Because they got the information from other kids. And so it was, it was the use of text, um, it's the use of words and, and that way of getting messages across that created this big change that was saying this is a huge act of resistance. And for me, when you look at the books I write, a lot of times they are about asking those bigger questions of why, 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 because that's what a writer does. They take in everything and ask questions about it constantly. I think it's important for teachers to encourage their students to be writers right now and always because of the power of our voices. I think everyone has a story to tell and I think um, a right to tell it and the stories of young people are the most powerful and the ones the rest of the world needs to hear. I think the young people are going to bring it and are going to change the world and, and writing is a powerful tool and it's the um, tool that we can use toward creating change. It is also the tool that we can use to empower ourselves, to get our stories, our voices, um, our histories on the page for the rest of the world. It's a way of legitimizing our existence and, and letting ourselves be heard.